Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your magical witch boys. Wait, what? Who wrote this? Let's try again. We are your supreme sorcerer hosts. I am John. And I'm CC, and this is the show where we cast powerful review spells on all the anime series from the previous season we did at Didn't Work Start to Finish. Uh, we already had a double dip of witchcraft in episode 23 of our show with Strike Witches and Izetta, but since they are more popular than ever, here we are again with another double dose of magic and sorcery. Uh, first, I'll take a look at the unusual team up of an all powerful but not very world savvy witch and her bestial bodyguard in Grimoire of Zero. And then John is going to wrap up the show with the new smash hit from Studio Trigger and the lovable scams from Little Witch Academia. So stay tuned, we will quickly grab our flying brooms and be right back. One of the main protagonists in Grimoire of Zero, I have a really big problem pronouncing that word for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one of the main protagonists is uh, a mercenary. Not your run-of-the-mill cell sort, though. Uh, he's a beast fallen. Half human, half tiger. He is cursed to walk the earth as a feared and hated creature who wants nothing more than to be a normal human being and become the cook in his own tavern. Uh, out of the blue, his dream becomes tangible when he runs into the witch Zero. Uh, Zero is on the search for a powerful book she wrote on magic, the titular Grimoire of Zero. You see, magic is a rare thing in this world. Most witches use sorcery, but the concept of magic that Zero came up with and wrote down in her book is much more efficient and powerful. So, basically a leap forward in witchcraft that would make every witch who can wield it a dangerous force to be reckoned with. So obviously, Zero doesn't want it to fall into the wrong hands, and uh, since it's been, you know, taken from her, she wants to get it back. Problem is, she has spent most of her life sheltered in a cave, and knows pretty much nothing about the outside world. So when she runs into the mercenary, she promises him to turn him into a normal human being if he helps her find her home and, you know, is place her bodyguard on a way, protect her and everything. And even though the mercenary is very reluctant at first, because, you know, witches usually kill Beast Fallen to gain their power, uh, he eventually agrees to the contract, and both of them, you know, later joined by the young witch boy Albus, embark on a journey that hurls them into a brewing conflict between humans and witches. Uh, they encounter more Beast Fallen on the way, and eventually an old acquaintance of Zero, who plays his own dangerous game behind the scenes. So yeah, this uh, fantasy series is based on a light novel by Kakaru Kobashiri, uh, illustrated by Yoshinori Shizuma. And there's also a manga adaption, which is illustrated by Takashi Iwasaki. I don't know if there are any big differences between the light novel and the manga, and what the anime is directly based on, or if it's an amalgamation of both. Uh, but both the light novel and the manga are still running, so there's that. The anime is produced by White Fox, which are probably most well known for the anime adaption of Steins Gate, a series I haven't watched. John, have you seen that? <laughs> uh, here's the thing about Steins Gate. I had been holding off on watching it because I have the game and I've kind of like dipped my toe into the game, but eventually it's something I want to get to. Okay. I've heard, uh, I have heard good things about the show. Uh, I've listened to the uh, Easy Anime podcast for, you know, that talks about that sh show in specific, which was kind of a bad idea because they spoiled one of the major plot points, which I didn't expect. Whoops. Uh, but, oh well. Uh, it still sounds interesting. I might still watch it. Um, it sounds like a cool time travel show, and I'm always up for that. But I've seen three of White Fox's other produced shows, namely uh, the first one being Jormungand, which was about this young lady weapon stealer and had kind of a Black Lagoon-ish feel to it. Definitely not as good, but I enjoyed it. Then the second one being Akame Ga Kill, which, uh, you know, is like this really dark fantasy anime with lo lots of blood and people killing each other. You know, these basically these, this assassination guild. It revels a bit too much in its, you know, edgelord attitude and aesthetics, but just like <laughs> Jormungand, it had great action scenes, and I liked it for what it was. Uh, and the last series, The Devil is a Part-Timer, 
Uh, which was a pretty unique comedy slice of life show where an evil demon lord and his posse come to our world and have to learn how to work normal low income jobs to pay their rent. Uh, I, I love that show. and I'd be It was up, pretty great. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I'd be up for a second season of that, but sadly there seems to be nothing on the horizon. But the original light novel and manga adaption, and, or at least one manga adaption, are still running for that as well. So who knows? Seriously, White Fox, get on that shit. So yeah, good studio, responsible for some really cool series. Not too outstanding when it comes to actual animation quality, but decent base, li uh, base level uh, with some great highs, especially you know on the fight scenes in Akamega Kill, for example. Grimoire of Zero seems a bit of a lower budget. I mean, the backdrops and character designs are nice. Uh, I like that the Beast Fallen don't have to you know, humanized or anime-esque prettied up faces and designs. It keeps the series from drifting into uncomfortable furry territory. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it actually feels more like something Disney would have cooked up back in the day, design-wise. Or at least mm. that's what it reminded me of. It, albeit a lot darker in tone and everything. But yeah, design-wise, it, it's got much more of a cartoony vibe than I expected, and I appreciated that. The director, Naoto Hosoda, worked on Shuffle, which I've only heard of in passing. I think that's like a romantic comedy drama thing. Um, yeah, I've heard of that, but I've never seen it or played it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, me neither. Uh, the other thing he's probably famous for is Future Diary, Mirai Nikki, uh -huh. which apparently is somewhat of, of a wild trash fest. <laughs> if I remember correctly, um, but he was also director, uh, the director for the previously mentioned Devil Is a Part Timer, which you know I and John can attest to doing him doing really good work on that show at least. So there's that. Uh, when it comes to Grimoire of, Grimoire of Zero, the direction is pretty standard. There's nothing really that stood out to me. The fight scenes are right, but it's a bit generic. So. Nothing to really write home about. Uh, it doesn't look bad, but it's still a bit by the book, so to speak, just, you know, in general direction and everything. When it comes to the story, Grimoire of Zero is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, actually, it reminded me a bit or even a lot of another show we both watched, and that is Chaka the Coffin Princess. There. That yeah. I mean, you say that, and that's kind of both good and bad. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's the thing. And pretty much in the same way, there, there are uh, some similarities. Both have an interesting like trio of main characters. I think we both like the char uh, main characters of Chaika quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the fantasy world they live in is pretty cool. There are some neat setups and mysteries. Uh, but both shows suffer pretty much the same fate in that the conflict and payoff in the final act are not all that surprising or interesting. They also share a weak antagonist. I don't even remember the final bad guy in Chaika, to be honest. But the one... Isn't it just... Yeah. Mm, I'm trying to recall, too, and it's pretty tough. <laughs> I, I think that... I mean, that says a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the one in Grimoire of Zero is just incredibly bland. They they try to build him up a bit as this kind of menacing, powerful pu puppet master who has a somewhat interesting connection with Zero, but they don't really do anything with that in the long run. And he has this constant deadpan expression on his face, like he barely emotes at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't make him cool or anything or mysterious. He's just boring most of the time. The way he talks, the way he you know, looks, the way he reacts to things is just... He's just there. He's just so nah, okay. Nah, nah. I don't know. <laughs> he really he didn't get on my nerves or everything. He's just like man. He's he's boring. <laughs> uh, so, so while I liked some of the smaller stories and arcs in the sh uh, personal character arcs in the show and the smaller you know closed off um, you know episode long stories, uh, the big central conflict and the players participating in it aside from our main characters left me pretty cold so that's kind of a shame because you know the show, show starts off pretty promising and oh where might this go and at the end uh, it's I don't know it's kind of nothing 
I wouldn't mind seeing a second season of the show, though, because I really liked some of the characters, especially our main duo, Zero and the Mercenary, whose name we still haven't learned by the end of the season, by the way. What? <laughs> yeah, he's just, you know, he's just going by Mercenary all the time. That's uh, what Zero calls him all the time. Ah, I forgot the Japanese expression. But yeah, she just calls him mercenary. He calls himself mercenary all the time. So yeah, we haven't heard his name yet. I don't know if his name has been revealed in the light novels to this point. Uh, if it is of any significance at all. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, um, I, I just love their dynamic. Uh, they're starting off with you know him really not wanting to engage with her aside from being her bodyguard. You know, even though she's nice to him and everything... Uh, Zero is general, really nice person, but he has a lot of baggage due to being a beast fallen since childhood, and he's made some bad experiences with humans and witches. And, you know, he's an outcast and everything. And, yeah, you know, so far, witches have only tried to kill him, and vice versa. He's killed some witches. So he is expecting Zero to betray him eventually. Uh, but then they slowly warm up to each other, you know, still dishing out enough jabs here and there to keep the comedy going. And, yanking each other's chains and everything, but building up a level of trust and becoming friends eventually. So, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. It's just nice to see uh, how these become, like, a, a, a cool team and a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and, and, and there is a bit of, you know, your usual romance teases and setups in there, but they are mostly played for laughs, thankfully, because Zero is... You know, it's it's mostly because Zero is not accustomed to living in the outside world and how to behave normally and everything. So you got your typical awkward scenes where she acts, you know, not according to society standards and everything. And uh, the mercenary is embarrassed by her and, you know, doesn't know what to do with her and everything. And yeah, it's, you know, it's all played for laughs. And, and I'm glad that it stays more a friendship an equal, like, I protect you, you protect me relationship. Uh, because that really works for those characters. And also, if they had gone the other way, it would have been kind of awkward and weird because he looks like a tiger and she looks like a child, even though she's <laughs> supposed to be really old. It's anime, what you gonna do? <laughs> your, you know, your typical stuff. I think they're a great team and an unusual one at that. And I would like to see them go on more adventures together. I also love the ending animation uh, where Zero tries to sneak up on the sleeping mercenary to lie on his chest because it's warm and fuzzy. And he chases her away angrily two times. And then at the very end, he you know, just gives up and begrudgingly lets her sleep. It's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. Uh, one of my favorite endings this season. Another great character is Hold'em, which... He starts off as a bit of a cocky villain type character, like a bit roguish, but kind of an asshole too. He's this arrogant wolf beast fallen who clashes with the mercenary several times. But I could already tell like from the opening that he would play a different role eventually, that he would switch side and everything, because he's featured prominently in the opening and it doesn't seem like, you know, he's hey, I'm 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 the main asshole guy who, you know, who's, I don't know, henchman of, of the main baddie or something, no. And we see his character turn around later in the series, and he's also has an interesting relation to another important character. Uh, and he's just plain fun. Uh, he and the mercenary have some great exchanges and repertoire and uh, comedic bits together. Uh, yeah, if there's ever a second season, I hope we get to see him as well again. Uh, I don't know about that, because, you know, like I said, he's pretty much tied to another character in the show who whose arc is kind of wrapped up by the end of the season. The season kind of leaves on, you know, the mercenary and Zero embarking on their journey together, just as two characters and everything. So I don't know if, if you know, we'll see some of the other characters again, if there even is a second season. I don't know how successful the show was. I mean, it looks like it got some pretty good ratings. So apparently, so, you know, maybe it'll come back for another uh, season. I guess we'll find out. I just want to comment that um, I had got a little confused as to this show's identity when it was first starting to air because White Fox has worked on another very similarly titled show called ReZero. I mean, similarly titled if you look at the full Japanese name because both of them had the phrase Zero Kara Hajimeru in them. And I was like, wait, are these two related? Are they not? 
And, you know, upon investigation, apparently, no, that is not the case. But just the same, it's it just sort of baffled me at first for whatever reason. Well, it's a less, I don't know, heavy uh, offender <laughs> than uh, the seven deadly sins Funkel, you know, <laughs> yeah. because those shows, even in the English translation, sound almost exactly the same. While in Japanese, they pretty much, except for one word, sound the same. One was like seven deadly sins, and then the other was seven mortal sins. It's like, wow, okay. Yeah, one was sin, Nanatsu no Taizai, and the other one was just Nanatsu no Taizai. Uh, and, and yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and at least in the English translation, uh, Grimoire Zero and Re Zero are, you know, you can they are, are able to tell them apart. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so there's that. I haven't watched Re Zero, so I don't know if there's if those two shows share any, uh, you know, common ground. I mean, one is an isekai show, and the other is just your, you know, plain standard fantasy stuff uh, with some beast men. Isn't that weird? A light novel that's not an isekai story. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I know I shouldn't say that because that's a pretty mean blanket statement, but it, it seems to be the rising trend. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll see how many we'll get. I uh, get pretty sure we'll get to talk about a lot of you guys shows at the end of this one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, more to uh, stuff to come of that, but uh, we'll see. But yeah, uh, not really much more to add. This was bound to be a short review because there's not that much substance to Grimoire of Zero. It's a, it's a it's a neat but flawed fantasy series with some pretty cool characters. But the first story arc is just kind of a letdown. The pacing is a bit slow in parts, and I it's kind of hard to recommend it. I'd say check out the first episode. If the characters are clicking with you enough, that maybe will get you through the series. At least that's what kept me going. Uh, if there's a second season, I hope we'll get a much more interesting main plot with some actual twists and turns and maybe a bit less standard for action scenes. I don't know where the light novels or the manga are going because I haven't read any of that, uh, but maybe there's some... You know, some interesting stuff in the future. We'll see. So far, definitely not a bad show, but a lot of room for improvement. So, the other show on the docket for today is Little Witch Academia. Pretty much uh, the big uh, darling of one of the past few seasons, you know, a show that I believe that both of us were very much looking forward to. Yeah, a lot of people are still looking forward to it because apparently only 12 episodes are on Netflix right now, if I'm uh, not mistaken. I think, well, they put up the first 13, and I think the, over the past couple of days they put up the other 12. So wow. if, if you've been waiting, you know, those extra four to six months to watch Little Witch Academy, uh, and you have Netflix, and you didn't decide to go <clears throat> other routes to watch it. Uh, now you can. Yeah, you, you don't have to feel like a, a filthy pirate. Yar. Didn't even didn't get a dub for the Netflix release. It did get a dub, and it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Better I don't, uh, turn uh, in another direction than expected. I don't like to shit. T- I. I I think both of us prefer subs over dubs, but I can appreciate a good dub. And I watched a little bit of the first episode of Little Witch dubbed, and uh, maybe it gets better later on, but from the first few minutes of the first episode, it certainly was not ringing true. I I don't think I've liked any English anime dub that I listened to. Except, I don't know, uh, uh, Bacano. I thought Bacano was pretty fun in English. And I think I, I haven't I haven't listened to too many others. Uh, I think just, just because, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a style of dub uh, that is... Anime, English anime dubs have a specific style to them. I don't know if it's because of the translation or the way the voice, uh, uh, the actors are directed uh, in uh, you know anime dubs. But it's so wildly different from what I, the English dubs I'm used to when watching um, original um, uh, American cartoons like Batman the Animated Series 
or um you know other superhero stuff like spectacular spider-man it just has such a different feel to it in terms of you know pronunciation intonation it just feels a lot more artificial to me and that just doesn't work for me uh you know so well every studio is going to do it differently and every Mm. actor obviously is going to have their own style but you know i mean if i could pull one fantastic dub out of my just off the top of my head cowboy bebop yeah everyone loves cowboy bebop i have not listened to that to be fair i've not listened to that in english that probably just really? in terms yeah well <laughs> like i said it just you know i i listened to it in, in german when i watched the show the first time and then i watched it in japanese or the other way around i don't know but I it's th- just, yeah i think that was one of the first times that i heard steven bloom and he is fantastic as Spike. And I mean, so is the rest of the cast. But, you know, his performance is pretty standout. Yeah. So I've heard. I've heard, like, Cowboy Bebop is the go-to English dub for, like, everyone likes that dub. So maybe I should give it a chance one of these days. And I think the setting works very well because this is more of, like, an, I don't know, international setting. Yeah, yeah. I've heard the English dub for Black Lagoon is also pretty good, if I'm not mistaken. I'm um, not familiar with that one. So. I'm going to check that out, too. Uh, I, I guess, in general, when the the setting is more westernized, then maybe an English dub works better. But you know, I'm I'm kind of just I'm <laughs> I'm so 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 not a capa- capacity uh, when it comes to English dubs. That's all I'm saying. Basically, I have not, basically not listened to any any English dubs for anime because you know I've checked out very few, and I'm just not. I, I'm just not that fond of them because, you know, it's not my native language. That's all. I know. I, I mean, neither is Japanese, but those is the, mm. that's the original language the shows were produced in. And, you know, that just feels different. I think the other big prevalent dub probably here in the West is the entirety of Dragon Ball. Yeah. And but I listened to that and I point it. I not like that. <laughs> I mean, I don't dislike it, but the problem is, you know, the, it was handed around so much. Mm. And, you know, there was some licensing, like, back in its early days when it was airing over here, where it was like, oh, you get to the part where, oh, Goku beat up Raccoon. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get to, you know, see him fight uh, Birder and Jason. Oh, no, we're, oh, we're, going, we're going back to the beginning. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't until um, it switched from, I believe the studio was Ocean, the Ocean Group, and uh, Funimation licensed it, and, you know, it finally started to move forward after that. I mean, when Funimation first picked it up, it was it was, oof, it was really rough around the edges. But, you know, what mattered to me was we got to see something that was new. What's, what the hell's a Super Saiyan? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but with, over time, and, you know, over the fact that, you know, Jesus Christ, they've redubbed Dragon Ball probably at least three times at this point. It, and it, it's kind of gone through its growing pains, and I feel like it's become more solid as time has gone on. Yeah, and I guess, like I said, it's probably it's probably a thing if you you know if that language is your native language, you're also more prone to like those you know that that specific dub as well. I'm not. It's it's not like I'm like man, uh, subs only always. Like I'm not one of those people. Like super weeaboos. It's like the Japanese is the only language. No, if the, if if a dub is well done, if it's my 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 native language, maybe maybe that's just the thing. Maybe that's. Mm. Or maybe it's just the style about American anime dubs that I don't like. I can't really put a finger on it. But I like enough German dubs uh, a lot more than other, you know, friends of mine who who watch anime as well and who are like, no, they're only shitty German dubs. Like, no, that's not true. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> there are probably enough people in in America who say there's only, they're only shitty American dubs. Yeah. Uh, who've actually to listen more than I did. And uh, I, 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 won't, I won't tell that I... I'm just saying that I I don't I don't listen to them because or don't watch English dubs because they don't give me anything over the Japanese ones. I mean, I'm a curious sort. Yeah, and, and um, that's good. <laughs> and I mean, I feel like dubs have been not on a sharp decline, but on enough of a one to be like you know they're not as prevalent anymore. So when you know a show that I watched and enjoyed. 
gets a dub. I like to, you know, be like, oh, you know, let's check it out. See how they interpret it, you know, X, Y, and Z sort of thing. Since Funimation took, like, you know, the big, uh, took over in terms of producing most of the uh, dubs these days, uh, quality-wise, it has become a lot better. It's become more consistent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sadly, <laughs> for my country, this is complete turnaround because we had the good dubs uh uh back in the day when you know dragon ball came out uh, dragon ball z came out over here and cowboy Bebo was released on tv and stuff and now it's just every dub i'm trying to listen to is just garbage <laughs> super bad yeah there's not any money there anymore and not put uh, into that and it's a shame uh, well at least i got Three of my favorite series of all uh, anime series of all time, um, Wolf's Rain, Cowboy Bebop, and uh, uh, Black Lagoon, got uh, pretty fantastic germed up. So at least I can't complain in that regard. So did any of the show, uh, shows besides Cowboy Bebop that you really enjoy get really good English dubs in your opinion? Uh, I mean, the amount of dubs that I've watched since after that has you know sharply declined so i kind of feel like it's tough to make that judgment call like i mean i've watched clips here and there of some shows like um even though i was lukewarm on love live sunshine as a whole the dub is actually kind of pretty funny it's pretty good it's uh, about as emotive as the original japanese so you know th they got that uh right so yeah, cool. Man, that was a giant ass tangent. <laughs> we should, yeah, we should but no, I didn't want to, I didn't want to restrict that or break that off. I thought that was an uh, yeah, interesting discussion. Anyway, uh let's get back to the review of Little Witch Academia. Little Witch what? Oh, right, that. We're talking mm -hmm. about that. That little show. <laughs> yeah, I guess she's a little mm -hmm. show. <laughs> that was not intentional. <laughs> My puns so are usually worse. <laughs> I, I try I for our, our listeners out there, I try to only make the top quality dad jokes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Little Witch Academy is Studio Trigger's latest offering, but it's, you know, also not their first tour of duty with Little Witch, which I think is worth talking about later on. Yes. So Little Witch Academy. It's basically a story in a world where magic is kind of on the decline in the present day. But the story focuses on this young lady named Atsuko Kagari, call her Akko. Mm -hmm. And she's determined to reignite uh, her own love for magic and, you know, to spread her love to everyone in the world by following in the footsteps of her idol, Shiny Chariot. <laughs> Uh, the problem is that Akko has zero aptitude for using magic. And on the way to her first day at the Luna Nova Academy, which is, you know, like the last bastion of teaching uh, traditional magic it's in Hogwarts, the world. Hogwarts, to be fair. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Hogwarts minus the sorting hat. Yeah. <laughs> on her way to Luna Nova, uh, Akko meets her future roommates, Latte and Susie. And they kind of get into a bit of a sticky wicket uh, in the process of uh, trying to get out of trouble. Uh, Akko happens upon this artifact called the Shiny Rod, which once belonged to Chariot. And she somehow, somehow, awakens uh, its power, if only briefly, to ward off this monster that is chasing the three of them. And, you know, seeing that, you know, this rod still has its magical powers renews her resolve to learn to use magic and to try to make a name for herself and to you know spread the word of how wonderful magic is to the rest of the world that's more or less the basic setup it's directed by yo yoshinari who's you know obviously a, very much a trigger uh veteran with those shows under his belt like Gurren Lagan, Kill the Kill, Panty and Stocking, Space Patrol, Luluko. And I believe he was also a uh, Gynax vet since he also has work like Gunbuster and Evangelion under his belt. Yeah. If you know the usual uh, trigger stuff, um, you know, Imashi stuff, um, if if you've seen Luluko or the more comedy core, um, you know, comedy styled episodes of Gurren Lagano Kill a Kill, you know what to expect from this show, I think, 
for a lot of uh, for a lot of the episodes, actually for more than I expected. Uh, it's it's very loud. It's very cartoony. It's a lot of times nonsensical. Well, kinda. <laughs> eh, well, it's, I mean, that's it, what you get from a world where you know it, it's magical as opposed to you know. Yeah, yeah, and for the most part, it's still dialed back compared to Luluko, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's you know more, a bit more comp- comprehensible. I mean, I'd um, say it's dialed back most to everything else. Trigger. Yeah, uh, but the comedic timing is good, and there is a lot of creative stuff in there. Uh, I love the episode where they go into Susie's head. Yes, you know she's also kind of my favorite character of the bunch. Um, <laughs> I also like the cool fantasy settings and environments and monsters the show has to offer. It's all very imaginative and. Uh, just a lot of cool stuff to look at in that show. Yeah, but like I said, it's a lot more comedy-focused uh, standalone episodes in this show than I expected. Like, in the first two-thirds, pretty much, the main story kind of only kicks into gear in the last third uh, when the kind of obvious antagonist shows up. I don't know, Did were you were you okay with that? Did you like it? Did you appreciate that? Uh, well, I mean, I feel like they sort of ease their way into that because the main plot at first focuses on, you know, uh, oh, here's the shiny rod. What do I do with it? Oh, you have to find, you know, seven magic words to make it do the thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was, you know, it took them a little bit to get to that, but, you know, that was obviously, you know, one of the big overarching plot points. And then, you know, again, when they introduced the would-be villain, Mm-hmm. I I feel like that's a good way of phrasing it. Yeah. Later on, I, I feel like they didn't introduce that character too late, though, because you know you have some shows where it's like, oh, the true villain shows up in like the tenth episode of a twelve episode series, and it's kind of like, hmm, you sort of get a taste for this character. Oh yeah, and, I, I feel mean, like a bit earlier on, and it works out better. And it's not just like it's just an. Antagonist uh, for antagonist's sake, like the 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 character has a um, a deep connection with another very important character in that show, and mm-hmm. you know all and their relationship and the conflict that arises from that all fits with the themes of the show of science versus magic and everything, and uh, that is always brought up in the show and always like this underlying red um, thread, uh, you know, that is woven through all the episodes, and uh, yeah, that works. It just works. Uh, it's just even Gurren Lagan felt like you know, even though you learned the real final, final, final antagonist pretty late uh, in the show, or at least in the second half of the show, feels like it had always had like a constant, I don't know, threat or danger in the uh, uh, you know looming in the background. First, it being the Beast Man and uh, King Spiral King. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then later uh, the anti spirals and everything, and uh, then for uh, Kill a Kill, you immediately got you know the student council and everything, and it it just it was more straightforward, and I guess I appreciated that more, and just Little Witch Academia, even though you get like oh, fine, Akko has to find all the magic words and everything, the first like two thirds of the show felt a lot more meandering to me. Like it's more, hey, let's have a goofy ad- another goofy adventure with these characters, and then with that side character and that side character. It's all pretty cool character stuff. Like it's it's pretty hearty and everything, and they each learn about something about each other and stuff like that. Well, not always, but you know, it's enjoyable for most uh, of the time. But you know, I may, maybe I'm just I don't know. Maybe I appreciate a more straightforward plot more, and that's why um, Little Witch Academia didn't resonate as much with me as the other two big trigger shows. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's uh, one of the things that uh, didn't didn't work so well for me. But a lot I mean, of other things did so. <laughs> I mean, I feel like though the plot was more consistent throughout because you know if you go back to something like, for example, Kill a Kill, they had plot points which they kind of glossed over, looked at, and then like almost immediately threw away. Like they were supposed mm-hmm. to be like uh, something about like an anti life thread bullet that like. Oh, we're going to use this thing. What, what happened to it? What, wasn't this part of your big plan? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. 
Yeah, and there were some, you know, one note uh, villains and uh, that that you know were thrown away after one episode and stuff like that. That happened mm-hmm. also a, a lot. I mean, there's some stuff, you know, in Little Witch Academia where it's like, okay, this is an interesting character, and then we never see him or her again. Too, <laughs> you know, there's one specific character that I would have liked to see more of. Um, you know, you know what? Who I'm talking about? That dragon dude. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's he's pretty great, and uh. You know, it's like it's only this one episode, pretty much, and you know, that's that's a shame. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, you're right. Uh, aside from that, it's it feels like it's more consistent in that it's being that it's more like focused on like this you know array of main characters who just you know have their fun little adventures, and it's mostly about you know Akko finding into her own character and going on this journey to becoming. Uh, you know, to to evolving and everything, and yeah, uh, the other characters too, even though not as much as her. Yeah, I mean, this is not the first uh, Little Witch Academia. The first incarnation of Little Witch Academia was part of an an initiative in Japan called Anime Mirai, Anime Future. If you don't want to be a weeb, um, that was based. I, I believe the deal was a lot of studios got like a stipend from the government to, you know, like be able to kickstart these um, new projects that, you know, they probably wouldn't have been able to um, do otherwise. Mm -hmm. It was been going on since about 2012 and Little Witch Academia was one of the things that came out of 2013 alongside another – a few other shorts, one called Ryo by Studio Gonzo, one called Aruvu Rezuru, wow, dressing it three times fast, by Zex, and Death Billiards by Madhouse, which is That's a crime. That's serious. Which we – is a crime that we haven't had a chance to talk about Death Billiards or Death Parade because yeah. they, are, they are both brilliant and it's a shame that we probably won't get a second season of Death of Parade. That makes me yeah. really sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it started off as basically this one-off in 2013. Um, and then Trigger turned to Kickstarter for um, Little Witch Academy of the Enchanted Parade, which uh, came out in 2015. Which is um, longer than the Anime Murai thing. Yeah, I mean... I mean, it's like closer to an hour long as opposed to a half yeah. hour. Um, the point is, you know, this series is Little Witch's third outing, and I feel like it's better for it because, you know, we already have, you know, these established uh, characters and setting, and um, I don't know if it feels right to call the series a reboot because it's kind of not. No, it, it really uh, isn't. Uh, I feel like the original and the uh, Enchanted Parade are more like stories that take place in Medias Res that yeah, aren't kinda. really that aren't really explored in the series proper. It feels like, oh, yeah, the the anime movie I think could be like in the first third, maybe of the series, somewhere mm-hmm. like you know, while they're still you know in, in basic training and everything, it works. I think the Enchanted Parade uh, OVA could be. Maybe even after the show is over, like you could watch it after that. It works for certain reasons as a you know special epilogue thing. Uh, I think uh, that would be maybe best, yeah. Uh, especially animation wise, uh, because uh, while the um, animation in the show is pretty damn great, mm. I think it uh, in the TV series it never quite. It quite gets as good as in the anime Murai OVA and the Endless Parade. I um, kind of, the... I kind of feel like that might be, and this is just a hunch. They probably didn't expect a uh, little witch to get to the point that it did, so they are able to put in probably you know a larger amount of effort into those two uh, shorts and. Uh, you know, because they were you know much shorter and much more condensed than uh, the series proper, and that's yeah. not to say the series proper looks bad because it does not. No, not at all. Like I said, great animation. It's just like if you have watched the anime Mirai, uh, w- w- Little Witch Academia, and the Endless Parade first, you have already seen the best 
the series has to offer in terms of animation. And even though the animation in the TV series is still great, it's not as good as in the OVA, in my opinion. It's just, you know, it doesn't reach the highest highs, even though there's some pretty damn uh, damn amazing scenes uh, in that TV show. It's just like, man, the, the final thing in Endless Parade is outstanding. It's just Studio Trigger going all, uh, go all out. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I, like I said, I th- still think the animation in, in TV series is fantastic. And uh, especially, you know, the comedy bits work really great because it's such a cartoony look and everything. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> a lot of transformations and everything and that all works with the colorful look of the show it's it's great stuff it's really great stuff uh and you know if you i think like i said the the, the ovas take away some of the of the later developments in the tv series mm. um especially endless parade does so i think at l- you should at least watch that after you've watched the tv series because, you know, there's some character constellation and the way characters behave and everything that, uh, you know, are built up in the series and, you know, are already taken as kind of granted in, in uh, Endless Parade. So, I don't know. You don't have to. Uh, you can watch the other two first. So, so did I and so did John. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe some of the stuff works better if you watch uh, at least one of the OVAs after uh, the TV series. I think my only negative takeaway, my only big negative takeaway from the series is that in spite of all of uh, these moments of growth and, you know, change that Akko has, they don't really seem to stick. No. My Akko... <laughs> That's a funny thing. Um, Akko is, was actually, you know, in general, one of the big downsides for me of the show because she was even for you know a trigger show she was a bit too much of a loud and grating character at times i mean she means well but boy is she overzealous and like i said incredibly loud and sometimes downright obnoxious and you know kind of horrible to her friends especially lotte Boy, did I constantly feel bad for Lotte in this show. <laughs> yeah. Man, she's such a kind girl, you know, who's, you know, introverted and everything. And Akko sometimes put her, uh, you know, pulls her out of her shell and stuff uh, like that. And that's good. But she's, she can be a real dick <laughs> in a way, even though she doesn't mean to and doesn't notice. But she's kind of self-centered and everything. And, you know... I nobody needs a, or wants a little Miss Perfect Mary Sue as a main character that's boring, but Akko kind of leans a bit too heavy the other way sometimes. At least for me, she did, and I, I often caught myself muttering "Shut the fuck up, Akko" at the screen <laughs> way more times than I expected or wanted to. So, uh, yeah, make of that what you will, because it's, maybe it's just not my kind of character, but. She was really a bit too hyperactive for me and uh, didn't, you know, often didn't learn from her lessons and everything. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't all stick. The important stuff does, at least later in the series, I guess. But early on, no, not really. Uh, (laughs) uh, I like, you know, but but I like her uh, relation with the other characters, at least to most of them. And, you know, the other characters in general. Pretty much the whole cast is fantastic. Like, all this, even the smaller side characters. I like, uh, like I said, I like Lotte and Susie a lot. I like the um, the other three outcasts. I forgot her name. One has an incredibly German-sounding weird name. She's the tech witch. Oh, you mean uh, Amanda, Yasminka, and Constance? Yeah, exactly. Uh, those, those two, uh, those three are also great. Um and that's what I mean by, uh, you know, that Endless Parade takes a bit away from, uh, you know, uh, some of the developments in the series. Because in Endless Parade, they are already, already like, kind of part of the gang. While in the TV series, they, you know, slowly are integrated and become friends with, with the other three witches, uh, you know, as well. So, yeah, that's why I said that Endless Parade kind of fits 
you know, at least a bit later in, in the TV series, if not after it. Uh, but yeah, uh, so there's that. Uh, I like those characters. I like um, uh, the teacher Ursula a lot for many mm-hmm. reasons. I think she's great. <laughs> I, also, I also really liked um, the antagonist. I wish we had learned a bit more, you know, about her, like even more about her past, although we learned a lot. But still, she's cool. Um, um, great connection to one of the other characters and everything. Also cool. I I, <laughs> I like that my nose for bad guys failed me this time around because I expected Andrew to turn out to become you know the antagonist. He, I I don't know about that. Like you were saying that early on, and I was like, eh, I don't know, man. Yeah, and I was wrong, and I'm glad I was wrong because uh, I, you know, he turned out to be a pretty cool character and pretty likable and everything. And you know, when I saw him first in the opening and everything, and the first time he and Akko meet, I was like, ah, okay, is he gonna turn out to be like? Because you know, he's kind of feels like he's the son of his father, and he's gonna be the the science guy, and Akko is gonna be the magic girl, and it's gonna be sci- and since science versus magic is one of the themes in the show, that's gonna be like one of the main conflicts. But it doesn't really become that. <laughs> he's kind of a semi love interest for her, uh, but. That doesn't all. That also doesn't really get. I don't know. Resolved or even, you know, developed. Really. <laughs> you know what? I'm kind of glad for that because not every. Even though I do watch stupid fucking rom coms a lot, not every story needs to be that, and that's fine. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't. I don't mind it like that. That it wasn't in there. Mm. Uh, but you know, they they, they kind of try to do something with that, and then. Nothing really happens. I don't know which which one were your favorite characters. I know it wasn't Akko. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, I liked Ursula a lot. Yeah. Because, you know, she, without going into details, just the way she tried, you know, play herself off in a yeah. very uh, unsuspecting manner. Also, one of the things that the... Uh, I don't know if... If it's Endless Parade or if it's the Anime Mirai thing, even that takes some of this, the, the development of her character and, you know, her backstory and everything away a bit and teases a bit too much for it to be that, that interesting of a development in the series. All the more reason to maybe watch the OVAs after the show. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> uh, you don't lose anything from uh, by, you know, keeping those for later. Uh, but yeah, Ursula's great. Yeah, <laughs> Like I said, all around, pretty much stellar cast. I, I I already said that I, you know, would probably rank Little Witch Academia third when it comes to the Astros. What what, what would your, you know, ranking be? Would did you like it better than uh, Gun Lagano Kill a Kill? Uh, I know you're more um, affectionate towards uh, your more you know slice of life uh, leaning shows and everything uh, and comedy stuff. So. Um, was this more maybe to your liking than to the two other shows, or um, did mm-hmm. did you like the setting more? I mean, I like that you know they were trying to do something different than what they had done previously. You know, obviously, um, the anime Mirai project sort of came in between Gurren Lagann and Kill a Kill, mm-hmm. so you know it shows that uh, Trigger has you know the know how to do something different than, you know, a bombastic over the top wah action series. But I don't I don't know if I'd put I'd probably put Kill a Kill first, then Little Witch, then Gurren Lagan, I think. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd probably put Gurren Lagan, then Kill a Kill, then a Little Witch Academia. But, you know, all this sounds like, oh, man, <laughs> this didn't live up to our expectations. I, uh, no, not really. I mean, I didn't have any special expectations for the show. It was like, okay, there's a new studio, studio trigger thing. Let's see what this does. And the only thing that, you know, I wanted from the series that I didn't get was, you know, an earlier, more, you know, straightforward plot-driven stuff. But that's just not what the show was. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this down to personal preference i'm pretty sure there are a lot of people that like a little witch academia the best of all those shows uh, of all of studios triggers output and maybe you 
your listeners will be one of those people. Uh, but yeah, definitely, um, Little Witch Academia comes highly recommended. Just it's a super fun show. Uh, it's really well animated. It's really imaginative. Uh, some great vistas in there. And uh, goddamn, now it's finally on Netflix. <laughs> So you have no reason not to watch it. Yeah, unless, all, you know you don't have Netflix. <laughs> I think all three are on Netflix: the series uh, Enchanted Parade and the original. Yeah, I mean, if you're a fan of, obviously, if you're a fan of uh, Trigger stuff, you're probably going to watch this. But if you're a fan of, you know, just really, again, their over-the-top bombastic stuff, but you know, dialed back a little bit in comparison. It's still, you know, very colorful, very vibrant, and a whole lot of fun. I think, I think uh, a lot of people can get some enjoyment out of this. Not just, you know, the niche audience. No, it's it's pretty. I think it's pretty broad appeal. And that is a wrap on the 35th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to vit.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. You can listen to our show on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Leave us comments and questions on Twitter, Facebook and our YouTube channel, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time and please join us again on our next show. Macht's gut. Take care, everyone. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. The last existing human on Earth and mighty fairy folk join forces in a battle against extinction. And then after that, we explore the trials and tribulations of writing a visual novel. Yeah.